Good morning. As you know, I'm a simple man and I don't know how to draw. So, praise God for the internet and people who can. <laughs> I'm going to start this morning with, I've been trying to describe for years the difference between living by law and living by the Spirit. Woke up the other morning and had a couple images in my head, so I went to research and find some people who put in close proximity to what I wanted to, to talk about to begin with today. On the board, uh, images of two people pulling a stack of books, uh, living life according to law. You live according to law, it's we're living apart from God. We want to do life on our own, in our own strength, and our own intellect, and our own abilities. But in order to do that, we're being fed all kinds of information. We have the Mosaic Law. We have the traditions of men, according to Jesus. The people would interpret the law how they wanted and created their own. Many of us have been in church long enough to know the churches have their own traditions that you have to kind of abide by. We have uh, the voices of our upbringing. We have the ways of our society. We have the spirit of darkness that's lording over us, and we have the weight of a guilty conscience. So to live according to law, to live independently from God, that's kind of how we go through life. Now, the books simply represent a lot of the voices that speak to us all the time. And if you've attempted to live according to law, which all of us have, you find out you get weary really quick. To try and do everything that everybody's telling us to do. You just don't have enough hours in a day to pull it all off. Something ends up giving. The other thing you find about this picture is no one's helping us. When you live by law, when you live independently from, from God, you will find that there's a lot of people telling you what to do, but they're not helping you do it. They're simply giving you guidance. <laughs> well, here's my counsel. <laughs> you know? So you're left to try and do it alone. And on top of that, a lot of times the voices are in conflict with each other. So you have to try and figure out which one am I going to listen to. That's what living by law is like. When you step into a relationship with God, all of that changes. It's supposed to change. Sadly, for many of us, it doesn't because we still bring all those other voices with us. But here's God's intent. This is how man was created in the beginning. This was Adam and Eve in the garden before they listened to the serpent. And this is what Jesus came to restore you and I to. To take on the yoke of God and to walk in a relationship with him. Notice that all the other burdens are gone. The simplified life is the Christian life. Why is it simple? Because I only have one voice telling me what to do. And I don't have a guilty conscience because he's righteous. If I do what he says to do, there is no guilt associated with that. So I can live free from that burden. I don't have to go by what everybody else is saying. I'm following one voice. The other thing about this relationship is he takes the lead. I just follow. That makes things kind of simple. I like that pathway. <laughs> you, follow, you go, I'll follow. The conflicting voices are gone. We don't have to choose. Now, it takes us a while to get to this moment in time because we bring all those other voices with us. But as we walk with God, God will begin to tell us which voices we no longer need to listen to. And we narrow our life down to listening to him and him alone. He leads us in righteousness. Our past has been forgiven. We don't have to deal with the guilty conscience. And if, in fact, we do something that he hasn't guided us to do, he says, come back to me, confess, repent, I will forgive. Come back into the yoke. Now, the other great thing about this relationship, folks, is he is the power to accomplish. 
We're not in this alone. You and I, as believers, become connected with, in relationship with, the one who created everything. The one who is all authority. The one who has all power. So when God asks you and I to do something, he doesn't expect us to do it in our own strength. He simply wants us to begin to move into the direction of what he said to do, and he brings all of his power and authority into that circumstance. I don't know about you, but that's a great place to be. I'll probably shared with you before, one of my great friends in high school was 6'6", 325 pounds. His name was Oscar. We called him the Big O. And Oscar and I were friends. I like that because when I was in high school, I weighed 127 pounds. So having a guy that's 6'6", 325 pounds, farm boy, goes to the state farm show, and he's got a pig under each arm walking around with him. That guy was my friend. People didn't mess with me because they knew they'd have to deal with Oscar. Teachers loved Oscar. i never forget, in world history class, sorry, reminiscing here, world history class, the guy that sat in front of Oscar was this little tiny dude, but he was always mouthy. And one day, he's just going, rambling, 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 and the teacher looks back and says, Oscar, fix that for me. Oscar grabs this guy by the shoulders and picks him out of a scene and goes, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Folks, you've got to understand, when we're walking in a relationship with God, the power who created all things, the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings, the one to whom every single knee bows, is in a relationship with us. When God asks us to do something, we are not alone in doing it. We need not fear. Page two of the notes, if you're trying to follow me. I'm going to put up one big picture of this because I'm going to refer back to this a lot. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is talking to the multitudes and he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. All you who have tried to live all of this life by yourself, without me. Live according to the law. You're burdened down by all that stuff. All of you who are weighed down trying to do life on your own. Come to me. Come to me. Take my yoke upon me, upon you, and learn from me. God's making us an invitation. Take my yoke upon you. Let me lead your life. Let me direct your life. Let me help you get things straightened out. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, compared to trying to live by the world, that's a major statement. You can let all those things go and simply follow that voice. I want to highlight something. This relationship is real. But for you and I as believers, it occurs in an invisible part of our being. In the notes I have, John 14 and John 16, where Jesus says when he leaves, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to indwell our lives. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will send you one who will tell you the truth. When God led the Israelites by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, they saw the cloud, they saw the pillar of fire. It was real to them. When Jesus walked with his disciples, they could see him. He was real to them. What we must come to the conclusion is that the Spirit of God dwelling within us is just as real as those two depictions.
The Spirit of God dwelling inside believers is not a myth, not make-believe. It is real. And he wants to speak to us. This is the relationship that you and I have with God through the Holy Spirit. This is what occurs within us. Hang on to this image. Because as we've been talking about going through the book of Matthew, Matthew is written to the Jews. Jesus is talking to the Jews about things they understand. And Jesus is talking from this viewpoint. Every time Jesus speaks, we must think of this image. This is what he's talking about. The truth is that before you and I, especially as believers, do anything in the world around us, we should first be engaging in that relationship. Actively seeking God and what he has to say. What does that relationship look like? Worship. We worship God because he loves us. We worship God because he saved us. We worship God because he forgave us. We worship God simply because of who he is, the creator of all things. He's far and above all that we ever will be. So we worship him. But we worship him in this relationship. Again, we have to get this image. We worship him here, like this, in this relationship. Admiration, respect, gratitude. The very thing the world is telling us that we should be doing for our mothers today is an earthly example of what worship is to be relative to God. Thank you for all that you've done for me. And that heart should never go away. Every time we face a challenge, every time we get up in the morning, we should be grateful that we're in that relationship. I don't have to go through life alone. In this relationship, we earnestly seek him. We desire to know what God has to say. And if you're reading the notes, I put a subnote in there that says, and not wanting to rush away from him. Too often my mind is thinking about all the things that I think need accomplished in a day. And I want to hear from God so I can get on to the other things. And God says, you've got the whole wrong attitude. I'm going with you into those things. It's not a matter of you engaging in a relationship and then walking away doing something else. But it also means I need to take my list of things before him and say, are these important enough for me to be about today? Or is there something else that you know that I need to be doing? So we worship God. We seek from him the daily word, what he wants for us today. We seek for him wisdom and understanding. How do I understand the word of God? I ask him, what does this mean? When I'm going through a situation, I'm trying to figure out how to handle it. What am I supposed to do? What should my actions be? What must what, what God would you have me to do? I'm looking for understanding for his clarification in my moment, in my circumstance. What should I be doing? Also seek the anointing of the Holy Spirit because, folks, if we try to do this without him, we are going to fail. We need him involved. In this relationship, then I also willingly, humbly accept God's word. Now, you can argue with God, but just understand, it's just not feasible. You can have a debate with God. He's not offended by that. I used to have arguments with my father all the time. I might frustrate him, but my father was open enough to let me speak my mind and exercise my viewpoints. But it always came down to this. As long as you live in my house... <laughs> <laughs> which be careful because the drive then is fine I can't wait until I'm out of your house but understand you can't bring that attitude into this relationship 
because this relationship is a commitment for eternity. So you can argue with God. He's big enough. He can handle that. But be willing to accept his word as final because it will be the righteous one. And then we need to humbly obey God's word explicitly. Because it's in obeying his word that God then is allowed to move and flow. Now, let's look at a section of scripture with this relationship in mind. Luke 11. We know it very well. It's Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer. But let's listen to it today in light of this relationship. Jesus' disciples come to him and say, teach us how to pray. And Jesus begins to teach them. But folks, understand, Jesus is talking from this point of view. Read this prayer. We're going to read this prayer, but read it as though you are this person right here standing beside God. Not that God's some way far off and you have to shout to get to his ears. You're right here. Hear this prayer from that perspective. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, does God require me to say that? No. Jesus is talking about an attitude. When I come to Jesus, when I come to God, I say, God, I respect who you are. I'm going to be careful what I say because of who you are. That's hallowing God's name. I'm coming to you earnestly for direction. Not as an opinion, but as the only word that controls my life. That's hallowing his name. Showing him the respect that he is due. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I am coming to you. I am yoked with you not to do my will. We just sang this. Not to do my will. I've come into this relationship to do yours. So tell me what it is that you want to do today with me. Now, folks, the reason that the Lord's Prayer is so important that those attitudes and those perspectives are crucial is because this relationship occurs in the invisible realm of my life and your life. No one else can see it. But what they do see is what you and I do and say. Because you and I are the visible representation of this relationship. And if we let God lead then his nature becomes ours. So that what people see in you and I is him. This is how we glorify his name. We walk in a submission relationship to God. And by doing that, we become the visible display of who he is. In the same way that Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. Give us day by day our daily bread. We've talked about this many times. This isn't the issue of asking for food. This is the issue of asking God for his word over my life for today. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, keep me from wandering away from you and choosing some other path. Hold me close. Hound me by your spirit. Don't let me walk away. Verse 5, And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. For he will... Answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door now is shut and the children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, 
Yet because of, it, of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So Jesus is elaborating on this whole prayer thing, about this whole conversation with God. He says, look, when you encounter something in the earthly realm that is beyond your ability, then go to the one who can help you. Jesus is using an illustration. He says, some traveler comes to your house. Somebody comes and knocks on the door. You know them. They're friends from a long time ago. You didn't know they were coming. They show up and, they, and you want to feed them because they're hungry. And you don't have enough. So you go over to your neighbor and say, hey, can you lend me some food to help feed these people? So Jesus is saying, you are encountering something in the earthly realm that is beyond your ability. So go to someone who has the supply to help you. What's he talking about? As you walk with Jesus, as you walk with God in this relationship, we're going to encounter all kinds of things that are beyond our ability. You say, well, I can do a lot of things. Let me rephrase that. We're going to encounter a lot of things that we are going to be unprepared to behave righteously in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, this is the point. We will encounter a lot of circumstances to which we are ill-prepared to be righteous in that moment. So Jesus says, recognize the one who is righteous, the one who can tell you what to do, and the one who will give you your strength to do it is right with you. So ask him. Ask him for help. So Jesus goes on. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. This isn't just God help me understand the text of the Bible. That is a valid thing to seek God for. But it's not limited to that. It's like, God, what am I supposed to do in this moment? God, how am I supposed to handle this person who's before me? How am I supposed to handle the things that I'm going through? The report that I just got. How am I supposed to handle those things? Go to God and ask him. If a son asks for bread and, the, and any father among you, he, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we recognize our lack of ability to be righteous, we need to ask God, and God says he will faithfully supply us with his presence, with his wisdom, with his guidance, and his power to be righteous in that moment. In Exodus, the 33rd chapter, it's not in your notes, Moses is facing entering the promised land. And he has a conversation with God. I love this. Moses is having a conversation with God right here. Moses is having a conversation with God. He says, you haven't told us who you're sending with us to go into the land. And God says, I'll go with you. And Moses says, that's great. But if you don't go with us, don't send us. Listen to his heart. God, if you're not going to go with me, don't send me. Jesus is telling us here in the Lord's Prayer that God is going with us. Wherever he sends us, he's there. Because that relationship is intertwined. The great thing about being in a relationship with God is wherever he sends us, he already is. How does God give the Old Testament folks prophecies about the future? How does God give us the book of Revelation? Because he's already there. He's eternal in every respect. He's unbounded by time. So understand, folks, that whatever God asks you and I to do, his presence is always in front of us. He is with us, but he's already in that moment. 
So we simply rely upon him to guide us in what are we supposed to do. Now let's jump into our Matthew study, uh, page three of the notes, if you're following me there. Let me just cover real quick the first four of the Beatitudes as we move into today's study. The first four Beatitudes are built upon a relationship with God, and they're based upon this whole issue that we just read through of the Lord's Prayer. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that we lack the ability to be righteous on our own. Therefore, we turn to God. Blessed are the, those who mourn. I mourn over that condition. God, I'm incapable of doing it on my own. So he moves into, he says, blessed are the meek. The meek are those who ask God for help. The meek is the man who had people come to his house that need fed. And he goes to his neighbor. That's meekness. Again, frowned upon by the world. Forget what the world says. Understand things from God's perspective. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. First four Beatitudes, Jesus is talking about this relationship. When you've tried life on your own and recognized you can't do it, you're poor in spirit, and you don't know what you're going to do, so you mourn, then you turn to God in meekness, and you come into this relationship, and then on a daily basis, you hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, what is it we're doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? God says, don't worry about tomorrow. Concentrate on today. What are we doing today? So in Ezekiel 36, God gives a promise that he is going to send his spirit into the lives of people to lead us and to cause us to obey what he says. And he says, and you will be my people and I will be your God. Again, he's talking relationship here. Now, let's move into the section of Matthew where we left off last week. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Bottom of page 3 of the notes if you're trying to follow me there. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So from last week's discussion, the scribes and the Pharisees lived by law. They lived independent from God, attempting to do godly things without any relationship with God. We studied last week how they simply became judges of people. You're right, you're wrong, get out, you're unclean. That was the mannerism of their lives because that's what law does. It's why Paul writes and says the letter of the law kills. It is the spirit that gives life. So Jesus is talking to these people on the, on, uh, the mount up around the Sea of Galilee, and he's saying to them, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. He is not saying, try to live the law better. That's not what he's saying. The only way that our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is to stop doing what they're doing and get into this relationship with him. Stop trying to do Godly things without a relationship with God come into this relationship. Verse 21, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council and whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. So let me do a quick recap from last week. Jesus is saying basically the same thing three times. He who hates his brother, you call him raka, or you say you fool. Jesus is saying the exact same thing. What he's saying is, if you look at someone and consider them unworthy of your time, of your energy, of your prayers, of the gospel, of whatever, you have determined that they are worthless because that's what murderers do. Murderers take the life of someone with re no regard to who they are. They are worthless in the eyes of the murderer. 
So Jesus is saying, if in your heart you determine that someone is worthless, you're in danger of hellfire. Because God's heart doesn't look at people that way. While we were enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The love of God does not look at humanity as worthless. God looks at humanity through the eyes of love and grace and mercy. So Jesus is talking to these people and says, look, the issue of living a better righteous life is to deal with the heart. What's happening in the spirit and the only way that the spirit can get fixed is if you let it be reborn by my presence in your life. So the only way to look at people through the eyes of God is to be in a relationship with God and to let his nature overtake my nature. That God can instruct me how I'm supposed to look at them. Again, we look at the life of Jesus, we see these examples, right? The disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, we saw people ministering in your name and we told them to stop. And Jesus says, what did you do that for? <laughs> if they're doing it in my name, let them go. They were rejected through, from entering in this one town. And the disciples say, hey, should we call you know, fire down on them? Jesus says, no. You look at Jesus' life with his disciples, he was always correcting their perspective. Because they had grown up under law, therefore they were constantly judging people and judging them as worthless. So Jesus was constantly helping them see things from his perspective. That's one of the major roles of the Holy Spirit in our life. So let's get into today's study, page four of the notes. Everybody okay? Man, I'm having a blast. Verse 23, Matthew 5. Therefore... Don't miss this. That word, therefore, is a tip-off that what Jesus is going to say is directly connected to everything he just has said. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now again, folks, I love this picture because it, it paints for us what's happening. We tend to read verse 23 in that section as, okay, well, I've come to church, and I'm at church, and while I'm singing, God says, oh, by the way, you need to deal with a relationship. Now, that could happen. But look at it at its more purest picture. This relationship with God is going on inside of me all the time. And when I'm starting to have a conversation with God, God, what are we going to do today? God says, I need you to check your spirit against that person. But God, I'm here to, to spend time with you. He says, I understand that. But before you and I can really engage in this conversation and in this relationship, I need you to fix a relationship. Now notice how he reads it. If while you come to worship, when you bring your gift to the altar, again, it, he's using imagery from their past. He's using imagery of the temple. And when people would bring their gift there to interact with God, that's the image that he's using. But for you and I, folks, many times this is going to take place in our spirit. Not just on a Sunday morning when I show up at church. Get past that image. This is happening every day in our lives. When I begin to interact with God, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Now, folks, this is a very powerful picture to look at. Because Jesus has just got done saying, if you have determined in your heart that someone else is worthless, He immediately goes into talking to us about how this is playing out. 
These are not two different cases. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that a brother has something against you, what's he talking about? I have failed to do something in a relationship with someone else. And because I have failed to do something in that relationship, that person now has a charge against me. He said, well, I don't like that setup. Well, let's understand what Jesus is talking about. Ultimately, what it gets down to is, is I have failed to do something that I owe that person. So let's talk about things that I could owe somebody. I owe them love. I owe them forgiveness. I may owe them, oh, I hate this one, an apology. I may owe them grace. I may owe them mercy. I may owe them compassion. I may owe them payment for something that we've exchanged. I may owe them reparations for damage that I caused of something that was theirs. Pulling upon Romans, I may owe them taxes. I may owe them for services rendered. I may owe them obedience, depend on who they are relative to me. I may owe them provision. I may owe them truth. I may owe them to be let out of my expectation. Yeah, that one hit hard, didn't it? I may owe them an agreement to discharge an agreement. I may owe them the gospel. I may owe them intercessory prayer. There's lots of things I can owe people that they may not even know. So God says when you come to have this relationship, when you come to engage in this conversation, now notice what he says, and there remember. Why am I remembering it in this conversation? Why is it when I come to engage God in conversation that all of a sudden I remember? More than likely, folks, it's the Holy Spirit saying, oh, by the way, I am fully aware of how you mistreated that individual. And I'm telling you, fix it. You say, well, maybe they're the ones who caused it. He said, I, it's not what I said. God says, you can debate with me all day long as to who started it. That's not what I said. I'm telling you, fix it. Do whatever it takes to fix it. Because the reason that I'm not interested in fixing it is because I've determined in my heart they're not worthy. It goes right back to what he just got done talking about. If I'm unworthy, if I'm unwilling to repair a relationship, God says you have determined in your heart they aren't worth it. And God says if that's your attitude, you and I have a problem. Because John writes in 1 John, if you don't love your brother whom you can see, then you really can't love God whom you can't see. And if you say that you have this relationship and that you love him and in loving God you do what he says, but you're unwilling to do what he says because you're unwilling to fix the relationship, God says our relationship isn't what you think it is. Because you can't really express your love for me, which involves obedience to what I tell you to do, if you're unwilling to do what I'm telling you to do. Doesn't mean I'm not a believer. Doesn't mean I've lost my Christianity. What it means is that there's a relationship problem with God. And God says, I need you to go fix that relationship first. Then come back and we'll have dialogue. Now, again, don't miss this. Because we get the idea of God says, hey, go fix that problem. And somehow I walk away from this relationship. But I never do. 
God goes with me to repair that relationship. And he's already been involved of where he's sending me to go. So it's not that I depart from God and go fix it. Understand, folks, it's his word for the moment. Tim, this is what you and I are going to do right now. We are going to go fix this relationship. But because you are the visible part of the relationship, I need you to go. I will be with you. I will tell you what to say. I'll give you the strength, if necessary, to even humble yourself. I will give you the strength to suffer whatever it takes to make that relationship reconciled. Now, folks, understand, this is where the promise of Genesis 15:1 and the power of the resurrection come into play. Because in order to repair a relationship, it may cost me everything. And God says, you can pay whatever it takes to be reconciled. Because I've already made you a promise that whatever you need, I will supply. You see, folks, the only way that I can begin to look at those people from God's point of view instead of my viewpoint of unworthiness is to stop putting value on what I think I have. Everybody okay? Verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly. While you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to, ju to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. But surely I say to you, you will, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Let me jump ahead to page five, and we'll talk about because we'll talk about some things we go through here. Before we simply jump ahead and think that this is all about finances because of the language that is being used. Because Matthew is recording these words and putting them in an in a order to communicate something to Jews, let's understand this conversation from a Jewish point of mind. On page 5 of the notes, I have some passages out of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. What's he talking about? Our refusal to do what God is telling us to do. For the Lord your God is a God, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, the mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. The first thing we learn is, is that God is a God of justice. And he's looking after those who have great need. The fatherless, the orphan, the stranger, the widow. In Deuteronomy, the 15th chapter, God begins to give some explanation to the nation. Verse 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land, which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Now, this is simply part of a conversation where God says, look, if one of your fellow Brothers, struggles making life. Their crops haven't worked and all of that stuff. They failed. They don't have the supply. They, they can come to you and ask you to help them. And God says, and you are to treat them as a family member. Bring them into your home. Supply them with food. Supply them with clothing. Watch over and care for them. Now, folks, if, if we're like most people, we're running calculations in our head. Well, how much do I have to simply meet the needs of my own household? 
And now, God, you're asking me to bring these people in, and I know that guy, he eats a lot. I have no idea how my parents fed my brother and I. Because my dad got a lot of work out of us, and we ate the show for it. But hear what God is saying. When they come to you and they have need, whatever that need is, to whatever degree it is, do not harden your heart. Do not close your hand. In other words, it's the same thing that Jesus is saying to the people in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not look at them and consider them worthless. Look at them through the eyes of God. Care for them. Supply what they need, whatever it is. Now hear this. Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Hear this. And he cry out to the Lord against you. Remember what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 5? Make an agreement with your adversary while you're on the way, lest he go to the judge and say to the judge how you have mistreated him. Now again, folks, don't think about earthly courthouses. Jesus is making a correlation for these people, for these Jews, to something that they understand that was written in the law, and that is God is the judge. And God has said, if someone is struggling, you are supposed to help them. And if you don't, and they cry out to me, I'm going to show up and you're going to have to answer. Deuteronomy 24 is a similar instance of what God is talking about caring for people. He talks about paying a guy his wages each day. Um, and if you don't, and he cry out to, against you to the Lord, he goes on about not perverting the justice to the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. Uh, when you reap your harvest, don't reap the corners, but let them out there so that they can go get them. When you reap your olive trees, don't go back a second time, but let them have the excess. When you reap your grapes, don't go back a second time and reap all that's there, but leave it there for them. God is talking about showing people compassion and taking care of their needs. Now, just to make sure that we understand that this is what Jesus is talking about, in Jewish history, they stopped doing the things that God said. And God sent prophets to call an account. Now, on the bottom of page 5, and we're going to go into page 6, I have a passage out of Isaiah. Isaiah comes to the nation who has been mistreating each other, not doing these very things. In the context of the Sermon on the Mount, there are people who are looking at brothers and sisters, family members, and have determined in their heart they are not worthy of my time, they are not worthy of my care, they are not worthy of my mercy, they are not worthy of my compassion, because I'm not giving them the very things God said give them. I'm withholding. Now listen to Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13. Remember, Jesus says, if you bring your gift to the altar... Sermon of the Mount, right? Hear this. God says, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. God says, you people keep showing up to the tabernacle, and you keep showing up to the temple, and you bring your sacrifices, but I know that you're abusing one another. So guess what? Let me tell you how I think about your sacrifices. Let me tell you what I think about your worship. It's an abomination to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. 
Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. God says, if you're going to come and worship me, you should be doing this stuff first. Isaiah 58, we won't read it, but it's an incredible chapter where God is talking about people that are fasting. And while they're fasting, they're still making their workers work. They're taking a day off, but they're making everybody else go out to the fields and all this kind of stuff. And God says, is that the fast that I called for? And then he starts to delineate it. Is it not to set the oppressed free? Is it not to break the bonds? Is it not to care for people? And he goes on and says, and then, then I'll show up. So Paul, right in the church at Rome, page 6 of the notes, verse, chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And then he goes on into chapter 13. Render to those who all is due, owe no one anything except the love one another. Jesus is drawing upon these Old Testament pictures and speaking to the people in the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, look, God is a God of love. He wants to redeem. He wants to save. He wants to reconcile. He wants to forgive. He wants to show mercy. He wants people to experience all there is in him to experience. So do not determine in your inner man that someone is unworthy of that. And when someone has a need, and I stir your heart to meet that need, do not withhold. Because God says, if you withhold, you and I are going to have a real problem in our relationship. So he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go fix that relationship first then our relationship will be pure. This is what Jesus is talking about. Again, folks, the reason it is so important to understand that we are in a relationship with the creator of all things is that whatever is required to restore and reconcile God can supply. That's why Jesus says a little bit later here in the Sermon on the Mount, if someone asks for your coat, give them your cloak too. They ask you to go one mile, go two. They slap you on one cheek, give them the other one to slap two. He says, don't consider the cost. Because whatever you and I need doesn't come from that individual. It comes from God. And God has given us a promise. So if it costs me everything, if it costs me, if it would even cost me my life 
to see someone reconciled in a relationship and reconciled to God, God says, I'm the power of the resurrection. Even though you die, you'll live. There is no cost too high that God can't supply to you and I what it is that we need. This is what Jesus is talking about. Everybody okay? You stand with me this morning. Heavenly Father, in the midst of your word is truth that you want us to get because you want to change us. So I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to reveal the deep parts of these scriptures so that we just don't stay in some surface place. But we let them come into us as your word to surgically bring wholeness and healing in our lives by getting us to remove things that aren't supposed to be there. To have our thoughts and our perspectives transformed to be your, your thoughts. So Lord, help us to be aware of the voice of your spirit and what you're speaking to us in regards of our treatment of other people so that we can glorify you through our obedience to what you direct. Increase and strengthen our faith, Lord, in your promises to know that we're not alone and that whatever the cost, you will care for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.